I had an experience. I wasn't wearing an outfit like this then. But way back when I was first a pastor, before Lynette and I were married, I had an experience where you might, some of you might have had this experience. I'm driving down the road, lived in Fort Erie at the time, and all of a sudden up behind me comes a cop car, the lights go on, and do you know that feeling you get in the pit of your stomach at that time? Some of you are saying, no, I've never been pulled over. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So I pull over, and I watch, you know, you're in the rearview mirror, and I watch, and out gets this police officer. He puts his hat on. He's got the whole uniform. like, oh, man. He's like, what did I do? You know, what have I done? Oh, no. And he walks up, and he leans in, and it's Keith Bailey from the church, and he goes, Pastor, I just wanted to know, is the men's group meeting tonight? <laughs> Seriously, you gave me a heart attack for that? And he probably did that three or four different times, you know? What a guy. First time ever, actually, uh, he did this. I was living at mom and dad's. Lynette and I were engaged, but I was still at my mom and dad's. And so, so he, he followed me around the corner, you know, and around the next corner, around the next corner. And then he put the lights on just as I'm turning into the driveway at the house. You know, like, no, what if you follow right to my house? Oh, and he, he, again, I see him get out. He's got the uniform, everything on. And he gets out and walks up to the car and he goes, ah, nuts. I thought it was your dad. Again, you're trying to give me a heart attack here. What a guy. Uniform. You see somebody in a uniform and you stop and take notice, don't you? Um, one time I was down in Huntington and uh, uh, the bishop from the States, who was kind of over us at that time too, he went to the hospital. He was actually a former bishop. And I happened to be down there, so I went into the hospital. I was going to visit him. It's a Lutheran hospital. And as I got into the elevator, you know, we went up and kind of the elevator car was sort of full and we went to the next floor and, and uh, a pastor, probably a Lutheran pastor got in and he had his whole outfit jacket, you know, the collar and stuff on and, and as soon as he got in, like the whole elevator got kind of quiet, somber. Mm. And I thought, hey, I'm a pastor too here. <laughs> but I guess I didn't have on the uniform, right? For people who know. We're going to talk about a uniform this morning. That's what we're going to talk about. A uniform that was maybe only worn by 70 men over the course of over 1,400 years. So we're told. A uniform that was worn by maybe only 70 guys we're going to see. Now before we do that, as we continue, as we actually wrap up our series on the 10th of meeting, I want to have a little bit of a test. Two people said yay. All right, good. Here's our test. What have we been looking? Today we're going to talk about the high priest, but before we do, what are we looking at? We're looking at the temple, the, the tabernacle in the wilderness, the tent of meeting. So you come in, the one door, well, just a test to see if you can remember the names of the pieces of furniture that we've studied, every piece pointing ahead to Jesus and how God was going to redeem us. So the first, you would come in with your offering to God and you come up to the... Bronze altar. Good job. Excellent. And, and, and it was bronze, which meant judgment, and you would sacrifice your animal for your sin, and the priest would put it on that grate, and it would be burned up all completely, just like our sin is completely burned up. By the way, on the table in the back there, there is a whole scale model replica, and uh, thanks to Sherry Elric for putting that together for us and painting and everything. Have a look at that, the whole thing. It's to scale. Now then after that, you would go, but the high priest, because your sin was covered at that point, and the high priest, he would turn around and he would go to the next piece of furniture, which was called the, the laver or the bronze basin, exactly. And again, bronze for judgment. And the idea is to wash, to be cleaned. And indeed, when we come to God through the one door, the one way to God, Jesus, we come and Jesus has offered his life in our place, his life is the sacrifice for us, and we are forgiven. Amen? If we ask. But we don't want to just be forgiven. We want to be cleansed, clean, so we can be in God's presence, too. And so that labor demonstrates that. Now, once you're forgiven and cleansed by God, you're in his presence. You're in his family. You're in. So we move inside. And we're in the presence of God. Again, there are three more pieces of furniture. There's seven all. First, on the left, you would have the... 
a golden lampstand indeed that represents God who is light and his word, which is a light to our feet, lamp to our paths. And then on the other side would be the table of showbread in the King James, table of presence bread as well, which represents fellowship, us with God, us with each other, the loaves representing all the people. And then just in front of the veil, we have the altar of incense. Oh, good stuff, which represent prayer rising up to God. And you know what? And then, on, of course, on the other side of the veil is the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence himself. And we go from sinful to holy, from guilty to forgiven, from dirty in our sins, really, where all of our good deeds are like filthy rags, the Bible says, to being totally cleansed. And when we're in God's family, what do we do? We read his word, we fellowship with others, and we pray. And that's how a Christian grows. Amen? I mean, it's amazing how this study, how this that God set up thousands of years ago, literally, all pointed ahead to Jesus. And here's God enthroned. Two more pieces. The chest was there, the Ark of the Covenant, and then the mercy seat there. And by the way, I should have put this up on the screen, but if you lined them all up and looked at them again, here's the bronze altar, then the bronze basin, then on the two sides you've got the lampstand and the table of showbread, and then above that the incense altar and then the Ark. Do you notice what that makes? A cross once again, even in the way they're set up. Amazing stuff. Amazing. Let's talk about the high priest this morning, okay? So let's read together. If it's in your notes, it's also on the screen. God says to Moses up on Mount Sinai, Moses, have Aaron your brother brought to you from among the Israelites, along with his sons Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, so they may serve me as priests. Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. Tell all the skilled men to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve me as priest. Now these are the garments they are to make. A breast piece, an ephod. Now he's going from the outside in. A breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a, a woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons so they may serve me as priests. Have them use gold and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen. Now, by the way, those are the same colors and the same materials that are used in the covering over the tent of meeting as well. We'll talk about that more. Each week we've been listening to it and, and watching it as well as reading it. Your brother Aaron and his sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, will be set apart from the common people. They will be my priest and will minister to me. Make special clothing for Aaron to show his separation to God. Beautiful garments that will lend dignity to his work. Instruct all those who have special skills as tailors to make the garments that will set Aaron apart from everyone else so he may serve me as a priest. They are to make a chest piece, an ephod, a robe, an embroidered tunic, a turban, and a sash. They will also make special garments for Aaron's sons to wear when they serve as priests before me. These items must be made of fine linen cloth and embroidered with gold thread and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. All right. Now, before we talk about the high priest, let's do a quick review, if we shall, if we can. We've been looking all this year at building on God's foundation and understanding our Jewish roots, and it's just been a blast. I've learned so much myself, and it's just been great to see our faith affirmed as we've looked at the Old Testament and what God said in the New Testament and Jesus and how he fulfills everything. You'll remember that. We started in January looking at the Shema, which says, the word Shema means here, Deuteronomy says, here, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. And, and we talked about mezuzahs on the doorpost, and just that was wonderful. And in February, we talked about the prophecies of the Messiah, prophecies of his, his lineage, his life, his suffering, his death, 
his coming again. And, and again, looking at all these prophecies in the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfills half of them. He fulfills all of them. Now, there are still, I know that's why some of you were, what? There are still some to be fulfilled when he comes again. Amen? We saw then the spring feast days, how the Passover points to Jesus, our Passover lamb who dies for our, in our place. How the Feast of Unleavened Bread is about taking away sin, just like they took away yeast and leaven from their homes. How the Feast of first fruits is our Easter. And on that very day, when they would talk about the seed falling in the ground and dying and coming to new life, Jesus had been buried in the ground, and rose to new life, the first fruits of all of our eventual resurrections to eternal life, Jesus rose on that very day. Amazing stuff. Now, since we were talking so much about all this Old Testament stuff, you know, it's easy, I think, sometimes for us to get a little bit, oh, that is so great. We need to do all that stuff. And we learned from the book of Hebrews in May and June that Jesus is actually greater than all that stuff and fulfills it in the summer we looked at galatians because again people could get trapped in legalism and all the laws and no god says we are free for freedom's sake jesus died so we can be free we looked at the fall feast days too and if jesus fulfilled the spring feasts when he died and was buried and rose again and sent the holy spirit on pentecost I believe he will fulfill the other feasts when he comes again. What do you think? You've been with us. There's a long time between the spring and the fall, and it's been a long time since Jesus' first advent and when he comes again. And the first fall feast is trumpets. And every time the Bible says Jesus is coming back, it says he comes back with the sound of trumpets. And the next feast is Yom Kippur, and he pays the price. It's judgment day. And of course he cancels our sin and then there's the feast of sukkot or booze or tabernacles when god lived with the people in the wilderness which we're talking about with the tent and how we will dwell with him forever after jesus comes back so the bible says we'll be with the lord forever that's been amazing and of course now we've been looking at the tent of meeting and if you want to take out that goldenrod page we are going to wrap that up this morning now, what have we been looking at over these last nine weeks? First, we've seen that God does want to dwell with his people. He said, make the tent for me right in the middle of all your tents. And of course, he wants to be with us forever. Why would a pure, holy God want to be with stinky with sin people like us? We talked about how that would be like us moving into a chicken coop. It'd be crazy. Why would you ever do that? Why would pure God ever want to be with us? But he does. He made us for a relationship. That's why he made us in the first place. So he wants to dwell with us and sent Jesus and will be with him forever. We've been learning too that God is very specific about how we are to worship him. He said, make every piece exactly the way I told you, exactly the way I showed you. And, and even here with this priest's outfit, he said, Wear this and make that and then this over that and every piece we're going to talk about has meaning to it as we look at it in just a moment. And then we've been learning that God is holy and expects us to be holy as well. He's holy, separate, apart, different. And we need to be different than everybody else too. We need to be different. Not weird and obnoxious different, but different and we'll wrap up at the end of the day where we start here, different in the sense of we are, we as Christians should be more loving Amen? We should be more hopeful. We should be more positive. We should be people with more integrity than anybody else as Christians. God is holy, and here's what he says. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. He calls us to be holy like him. Well, let's talk about the high priest here this morning and take some time and do that. You know, there are actually two lines of priests. The Bible talks about two different lines of priests. And so let's talk a moment about those two. Levi was the son of Jacob, the third son. You got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, his 12 sons, Levi's the third. And God said, from the tribe of Levi, I'll bring priests. Now, with Levi's sons, Levi had Kohath and Gershon and Merar, and uh, one of them, they were the family that 
tore down all the stuff in the temple, and they were the ones that carried it when they wandered in the wilderness and then set it back up again. And another one of these families, their job was to prepare the site, the holy site where the tabernacle would be set up and the sacrifices. But only one family, the Kohathites, the Kohathim, Kohanim. Thank you. Isn't it great to have a resident expert? And Jordan Chilcott here, he is from the tribe of Levi and uh, Kohanim. That's his family as well. And only that family could be the priests through Aaron and his sons. So that is the earthly line of priests. But the Bible talks about how a guy named Melchizedek showed up in front of Abraham four generations earlier. And Mel means king, and Zedek means righteousness. He's the king of righteousness. And Abraham gives him a tenth of everything he has, and then Melchizedek brings out like bread and wine. It's kind of like a precursor to communion they have. And God says that when Jesus comes, Jesus is the tribe of Judah, not Levi, and Jesus comes, and he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Aha, okay. Melchizedek, who has no beginning of days, no end. He's a priest forever, just like Jesus is. Now, all year long, we've been seeing that the things on earth are just a shadow or a picture of the things in heaven, right? right. On earth, there's just a shadow or a picture. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to look over on the earthly side of the high priests and other priests and what they did and war and what God called them to do because it's all a picture of what's in heaven and the high priest on earth is a picture of Jesus who is the greatest and final high priest all right so that's what we're going to do got your pen handy let's walk through some of this here this morning a little bit of the history of the high priest the first high priest was Aaron Aaron is Moses' brother. Now Moses, he's the great deliverer. He became the political leader, the civic leader. But Aaron, his brother, God said, God chose him. God said, Aaron will be the spiritual leader. He will lead the people in worship too. So that'll be great. Now there were, according to a Jewish historian around the time of Jesus, there were only 70 high priests in all. Because when you became a high priest, you were high priest the rest of your life. So your whole life, a whole generation. Josephus was a soldier against the Romans after Jesus. And he wrote volumes of history and says there were only 70 high priests. And the last one was named Caiaphas. Who has heard of the high priest named Caiaphas? Almost all of us. Pretty much all of us. Why? Because he was the guy who had Jesus arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was the guy who had Jesus brought to an illegal trial at his house. He was the guy that had him condemned and dragged before Pontius Pilate and said, we want you to kill him. That Caiaphas. Now, if he indeed is the last high priest, and, and Josephus the historian, the Jewish historian, says he was, that would be so fitting. You know why? Because Jesus is the final and permanent high priest. Jesus died as the lamb, sacrificed for our sins, amen? And he rose as the ultimate high priest between us and God to the point that we can only face God and be in his presence through Jesus. So even when we pray, how do we pray? At the end of our prayers, we say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' authority, I come to you, God. It's only through him. Jesus dies as our lamb, and it's so fitting that Caiaphas is the, Caiaphas is the last high priest because he's not needed anymore. Because who do we have as our great high priest between us and the Father? Jesus takes over as the final and permanent high priest. That's pretty amazing stuff. What's the purpose of the high priest? There's several things the Bible says that the priest, well, that's not just the high priest, but the regular priest would do. First, he was to serve in the tabernacle, leading in worship and leading in sacrifices. The priests were the ones that would go into that holy place. They were the ones that would replace the bread every Friday night when Sabbath started. They were the ones that would take and, and trim the wicks and pour the oil into the lampstand. They were the ones that would bring the incense, including frankincense. 
and light the incense altar. They served the people and served God. They, they worked at the church, if you will, to help the church body. Then secondly, they were to teach God's law. They were to teach God's law. And let me ask you a quick question. How many of you own more than one Bible? Uh -huh. How many of you have a Bible in your phone or your tablet? Yeah. Guess how many Bibles they had in Moses' day? The average person. Zero. None. How did they hear what God wanted? Well, Moses, God is telling him, and Moses is writing down the Torah, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. How did the people know it? They all came to the tabernacle, and the priests would read it to them. That's how they knew. They were told this is one of the jobs of the priest, to teach people what God was saying and what God wanted. And then thirdly, it was their job to seek God's will or, or to ascertain God's will for the people. If they knew what it was, like maybe it was plain in Scripture, they would tell them. And if they don't, didn't know, well, we'll talk in a few minutes about how they would kind of figure out how this would happen. And usually they were right. Mm, but then when they were wrong about what God's will was, boy, they weren't listening to God. And then there were some serious consequences for them then. That was the job of the priest. How do you become a priest? Well, there's a good question. To be a priest, you must, well, and there are four things. Wendy, can you come and be ready to help me here? No, sorry, my daughter, Wendy. She's all prepped. Sorry, Wendy. How many Wendy's we got here? There's another, there's a Wendy. Thank you, I see that hand. <laughs> Wendy's all over. Four C's that you had to do if you were a priest. Number one, you had to be chosen. You had to be chosen. In the time of the Moses, if a little, if a, a mother went to her son and said to him, you know, Judah, what would you like to be when you grow up? And he would say things like, oh, I'd like to be a fireman or a policeman. Work with me here. Or I'd like to be a priest. And his mom would probably say, oh, no, 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 no. Fireman, policeman, sure. You, you can't be a priest unless you're in the tribe of Levi. Or the line of Aaron, you, you can't be a priest unless you're chosen by God. <clears throat> now, today, anybody could be a minister for God, a pastor, if God calls you, and, and, and if he puts a desire for it in your heart. Paul writes to Timothy and to Titus and says, you know, it needs to be something that you have a desire for. So anybody, if God calls you and equips you, could be a, pr a pastor or a minister, but in that day, no, it wasn't a choice. You were chosen by God to be that priest. You had to be chosen. And then you also had to be clean. You had to be clean. Now, there are some pictures in the consecration or the ordination of a priest, which we're going to talk about here in the next moment or two. And one of the things, actually kind of the second step, is that that priest would come up to that bronze basin, to the laver. And as he was being consecrated as a priest, they would go and he would wash in that. Now, it didn't clean him, of course, right? It doesn't clean him spiritually in any way. But he would wash first his legs, and then he would wash with the water from the basin his feet, and then his arms, and then his hands, and then his head. And it was symbolic of how he was living a clean life so that he could live for God. His hands, his feet, his head, completely clean. You had to be chosen. You had to be clean. And you had to be clothed. You had to be clothed properly. And all the priests dressed the way I'm dressed now. All the priests had, wore a white linen tunic and a white turban. Between services, I had a lovely turban head, you know, underneath of my hair. Maybe you... Never mind. All priests dressed the same way. And in Israel, you'd look around and you could see them everywhere because they were dressed in white, head to toe, literally. And then finally, you had to be consecrated, dedicated, completely given to God. And so here's what would happen. As you would come in when a priest was being ordained to the job or consecrated to the job, he would come to that bronze altar and they would sacrifice a bull. And that bull's blood would be taken, now catch this, and it would be put on his right earlobe and some of the blood would be put on his right thumb and some of the blood would be put on his right big toe and you're all thinking right now, that's weird aren't you? 
It is. It's weird. But again, it's all symbolic because here is the priest ministering for the people to God, ministering for God to the people. And as he ministers and he's among the people, he needs to hear from the people for God. Amen? Amen. And as he walks around among, and he acts, he needs to act with God for them. And as he walks around too, there's his feet, his big toe, if you will. And he's got to walk representing God. That priest represented God to the people as he would listen and act and walk amongst God's people. Hmm. Now let's talk about the garments of the high priest. As we read and watched what it says in Exodus 28, God is very specific. And you've noticed every week God is very specific. This color, this material, put it together this way, this big, this size. Have you noticed that? And then he says, make it exactly the way I told you. And now for the priest, he's got some very specific ways for him to dress. And as we saw, get these special people to make it and make it just right. And here's where it starts. It starts with the, well, with this outfit that every priest would wear. And by the way, I want to say thanks to Rosemary Hood uh, because she made all of this. And uh, it's great. And so she's loaned it to us for us to, uh, to see here today. She was here in the first service, Rosemary. So if, when you see her next week, thank her for that. All the priests, not just the high priest, all the priests wore this. A white linen tunic and a white uh, turban. And by the way, the gold in the turban says holiness unto the Lord. It actually says this here. And that's what God told them to write on this turban. Because the white has to do with holiness, okay, with cleansing. Now, now picture this for a minute. One of the big jobs that the priests did wearing white robes was to sacrifice animals and put their carcasses onto the, the big bronze altar to be burned up. Who here would wear white doing that after Labor Day? <laughs> Crazy, but they were to wear white because it was symbolic of, of holiness and cleansing. And they were to remember that they stood representing God. But it was not their cleansing, it was God's. It was not their holiness, it was God's, from God. And it's amazing. Now, I want you to note, it's always called a tunic or a coat, but never a robe. A robe is different and specific, which we're going to see next. And so it was always called this. And these, these priests wore this, and this was their uniform. And there were hundreds, maybe thousands of priests all over the place. And you would see them. There might have been two million Israelites there in the wilderness. And you'd see hundreds and thousands of priests, and they'd all be dressed alike like this. And so you'd see them. But every once in a while, rarely, you might get a glimpse of something a little different. I have a friend who goes hunting all the time. And he says that, that in all his life, all the years of hunting, you know, like he's seen deer, all kinds of deer, all kinds of pointed antlers, everything. But he, you know, and they blend into each other after a while. But one time he saw an albino deer jump in front of him. And it's like, I remember exactly where I was and what day it was and because I had seen thousands of deer, but wow, this was so cool. And if you were in Israel in that day, you'd see hundreds, maybe thousands of priests all dressed like this, but out of the millions of people around, you might sometimes catch a glimpse of the high priest wearing more than just this pure white linen tunic. So we're going to talk about that in a moment. And by the way, do you know what? Did you know that when we die, this is how we'll dress? Maybe? Here's what it says. The white tunic, oh, I never showed you that, did I? The white tunic and turban were a reminder of righteousness. How they needed to be clean. And how it wasn't their cleanliness, but God's. It wasn't their righteousness, but God's. And there's the picture. And when we get to heaven, the Bible says, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Wow. Washed our robes, made them white in the blood. Now, do you wash something in blood to make it right? white? No. But spiritually, it's the blood of Jesus, the Lamb, that washes us clean. And so that's where we'll be. Now, I don't know if we'll always wear white. I don't know if there's going to be seasons in heaven. I don't, but we'll see. The white absolutely has to do with the righteousness that we as humans have from God. Amen? 
Now the next piece is the blue robe. And the blue robe is a reminder of God's divinity. All right. See, turban head. Turban hair. thank you. Listen, it's very Christmassy, although that's not at all the point. So the next piece, the blue robe is a reminder of God's divinity. Now, now robes have to do with position. If you're wearing a robe of some sort, there's a reason usually, right? Other than your bathrobe. If you're wearing a robe, a kingly robe, a king wears robes, right? Special king robe. Think about when they arrested Jesus, they stripped off his clothes, and the soldiers put on a robe and said, oh, hail the king. Look, he's got this kingly robe. And judges wear special robes too, right? You know their position because they wear that robe. So this blue robe was just for the position of the high priest, and he would wear that. And with the blue, it pointed to God. Okay, blue is this picture of divinity. When you look up, you see the blue sky. When you're looking up to God, that's what you see. And, and so we've seen through the weeks that this is a picture of God's divinity at the same time. Now, what do we have? By the way, yeah. God is everywhere. And do you hear the bells? There are bells all the way around the bottom of this. And they're for a couple of reasons. One, they're symbolic, because they do, you can hear them everywhere, okay? You're coming anywhere, the priest is, high priest is coming, you would hear them. And so they were symbolic about how God is everywhere, you know, as well. But the bells were also there because on the one day of year, a year on Yom Kippur, when the high priest would go behind that veil to offer the sacrifice on the mercy seat, these bells would tell people outside that he was still alive. And if the bells stopped and you heard a thud, you would know that God had not accepted his sacrifice or maybe him and God had struck him dead. And by the way, that's why they put a rope around his waist or his leg so they could pull him back out of there. You're in the most holy place. You don't just go in there willy-nilly. You go in there when... God calls on the right day. So the bells were there, representing God being everywhere. And there were pomegranates that were sown along the bottom as well. And pomegranates are fruit, and the idea is that we are to produce fruit. And God is the gardener, right? And Jesus is the vine, and we produce fruit. God coming from God, the energy that we get from God. Now after that, on top of this blue robe comes a tunic. All right? comes a tunic. And by the way, before I do that, hang on a sec, the white robe represents mankind cleansed by God, okay? The righteousness of God and the blue robe represents divinity. And the high priest is, is man representing God to the people and representing the people to God. But after that, I'm going to do this. <laughs> after that, the, on top of that, the high priest would put on what's called an ephod, okay? And this was multicolored, as you can see. And God said, we heard it, all the various colors that were to be in this. And these colors on this ephod also pointed to God. They were the same colors, okay? The gold and the red and the blue, the purple. These were the same colors that were on the inner covering of the tabernacle. Remember we talked about that? A bunch of weeks ago, the inner covering. So in a sense, when the priest, the high priest walked in there, if he stood against the wall, he was camouflaged. No? It's the same kind of colors. Now, these colors are specific as well, because I wish we had more time. Each of these colors represent an attribute of God, his royalty, his purity in the gold. I, they talk about God and who he is, and the priest would wear this ephod over top of everything else, his perfection, all of that stuff. But part of, after that, over top of the ephod, he would put on a breastplate, okay? And that breastplate would hook up to two 
stones, onyx stones, that would be on his shoulders. And on the breastplate and on the onyx stones were the names of the 12 tribes. So you would have Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, and on and on, all 12. There would be four rows of three stones in each. And then on the onyx stones on the shoulders, six of the names of the tribes were on one shoulder, one stone. Six of the names, the other six were on the other shoulder, the other stone. And it was amazing because the high priest would know. He's representing God to the people. And he would know that he would have the cares and the concerns of the people under, uh, on his heart at all times. Amazing? And he would carry the burdens of the people on his shoulders at all times. And by the way, folks, the picture of this high priest, the one between God and us, it's a picture of Jesus. All of this is a picture of Jesus. And does Jesus not have each of us by name on his heart? Did you know that the Bible says that Jesus has engraved our names on the palms of his hands? He knows our names, and they're engraved over his heart. And has he not taken the burden of our sins on his shoulders? It's amazing. All of it points to Jesus, who is our great high priest. By the way, there's one more piece here. And by the way, Jesus is man. And he's God, and he takes our sin. He cares for us, takes the burden of sin. Now, the Bible says that there's, there's something else that's a part of this breastplate, okay? It's called the Urim and Thummim in English, or in Hebrew, it's the Urim and Tumim. And Urim means light, and Tumim means understanding and perfection. And we're not sure what these are exactly. Now, there, there are... Two main ideas that over the history that the scholars have come up with. But here's what the Bible says. It says, put the Urim and Thummim in the breastplate. Well, that's interesting, right? So that they may be over Aaron's heart whenever he enters the presence of the Lord. Thus, Aaron will always bear the means of making decisions for the Israelites over his heart before the Lord. Now, it says here and in your notes, the Urim and Thummim are a reminder of God's will. Well, here's how that works. Let's say there's a decision that the people needed to be make, needed to make. What do we do? Should we attack the Philistines, you know, or not? What should we do? Well, some scholars believe that the Urim and Thummim were actually two stones, that there was a pocket in this breastplate, and that they were two stones about the same size, polished. One was white and one was black, perhaps. And when they prayed and said, God, show us what to do, the priest, the high priest would reach in, and the breastplate and pull out you know whichever stone was there and if it was say the white stone god was saying yes go attack the philistines and if it was a black stone god was saying there's one other choice here no don't attack the philistines so that would be pretty simple right praying trusting god help us to know yes or no right now many of our jewish friends believe that the Urim and Thummim worked completely differently from that. that and there are actually there's a museum in Israel which says that this is the case instead. And they say this. There are, on this breastplate, 12 stones, and the names of the 12 tribes, or at least maybe the first initial of each of the tribes, is engraved on these stones. And so some of our Jewish friends say that what happened is if they asked God a question... What is, you know, should we do this or that? that? That the stones with the letters would actually light up from God and spell out with this first letter of each what God wanted them to do. Kind of like a video game. You know? That would be incredible if that was true, wouldn't it? And which one is true? Let me reprise last week. We don't know. We just know that it was God showing them what his will is through the Urim and Thummim that the high priest made, and it was his job to help them to know God's will. Now, by the way, why today don't we, when we're trying to figure God's will out, why don't we today, you know, like pick a stone or flip a coin and, you know, heads means yes and tails means no? Why, why don't we draw lots? Why don't we do any of that kind of stuff today? Or, you know, close our eyes and flip open our Bible and say, God says... Why don't we do any of those things today? 
Because today we have the Holy Spirit in us to guide us and give us God's direction. We have the Holy Spirit. We don't do that stuff today. Now, by the way, can God speak to you when you blindly, you know, can he? Yes. Is that what the way the Bible is designed? No. Read it. Learn what he says and who he is and what he wants from us. Now, what do we learn from all this? What do we learn? Three things, very quickly. Number one, first thing I learned is that all Christians are priests. Every one of you today, if you've asked Jesus to forgive you and cleanse you, you're in his family, you are a priest today. You do not need to go to somebody else who is a priest, some ordained person, you know, with you know, special clothes or anything, you can come to God yourself with your prayers and requests. Amen? Amen. The Bible says he's, Jesus has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. That's us. Now, I've been ordained as a pastor and called by God, and I believe he's given me some gifts, you know, for teaching and leadership. But I'm, you are every bit as much of a priest, if you will, as I am. Now, a lot of places where I go, I'm the designated prayer. Maybe where you go, there's a designated driver. Hope not. But if you do, I'm the designated prayer. Let's ask the pastor to pray. Great. And I count it a privilege, and I'm happy to pray different places. I'm invited here or there. But you know what? If you're walking with God, your prayers are every bit as effective as mine. On certain days, probably more effective than mine. Because we're all human, but we are all priests as we're forgiven and called and commissioned by God. Did you know that? All of us. You're a priest. And as long as you're praying in Jesus' name, God hears you. Because he is the high priest. And that's number two. We are all priests, but our high priest is Jesus. He came as high priest of the good things to come. He is. We all wear the white of a priest. But Jesus wears the robes of the high priest and all the attributes of God, the divinity of God. That's Jesus. And then one last thing this morning. We are to picture ourselves in the white uniform, if you will, of the priest, understanding that our righteousness is our testimony. You, you, we are to picture ourselves wearing a Christian's uniform. Did you know that? Now, you, some of you were raised in the Salvation Army. That's not the uniform I mean. I mean the white robe of a priest. If we're all priests, we're to picture ourselves wearing the white robe of the priest. Now, we don't literally go around wearing white. But symbolically, how do people see who we are? How do people know who we are? We are to see ourselves, picture ourselves, wearing the uniform of a priest. What is that? Well, it's the, the white robe is the robe, what does white stand for? Our righteousness, right? People should see our righteousness. My mom, God bless her, my mom, we would go to different things and stuff, and she, she, we'd watch something. Mom, did you see that? And she, no, I was watching those people over there. Mom, the game is over here, you know. And she's, and she's, I think they're Christians. I, I just watched the way that, that man treated his son, and I think he's a Christian. I watched the way that woman treated her husband, and I'm pretty sure she's a Christian. She would play pick the Christian. <laughs> How do you see him, you know? Pick the Christian. My challenge for you this week is this. I wanted you to play pick the Christian, all week long, in reverse. In other words, you be the Christian. Can you do that? And if the people at your work or your school or your neighbors or maybe your family when you have your Christmas party, if they're playing pick the Christian, would they pick you? Oh. We are, as Christians, as saints, as priests before God, we are to wear that white robe of righteousness. And what does that look like? Peter says it looks like hope. And people see hope in you. Jesus says they'll know we're Christians by our love. Do you love more? He says we're to forgive even our enemies. Do you do that? If somebody's playing pick the Christian, would you be the one they pick because of what they see in you, the robe of righteousness they see on you. Would you? 
Now, again, Jesus says we'll be dressed in white then, but while we're still here on earth, here's what he says to us. Read it with me. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. When they see your good deeds, when they see the hope that you have, says Peter, when they see how loving you are, that you're a person of integrity, they will praise the Father. You shine with your robe of righteousness, and God gets the glory. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much this morning for the robes of righteousness that we can wear. Not the whole priestly garment, God, the high priest. That's Jesus, and we're so thankful that we can come to the Father through Jesus. But today, while we're here on this earth, we can wear the righteousness you give us. If we've been cleaned, help us to live that way. Not to run back to the mud, but to live in a way that shines for you. Our testimony is our righteousness, the Bible says. May people see us as we live for you, forgiven and joyful, positive and happy, people of integrity and forgiveness of others. God, you'll receive the glory, and we'll have the best life possibly we ever could have as we shine for you. And we say thanks for that possibility and the power of the Holy Spirit to do it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.